Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Simeon Morrow Public Speaking Presentations, Vienna Live with Simeon Morrow, and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please turn off your camera and microphone and or go to the LinkedIn Live video feed, the link to which I'll now place in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. This show thrives on participant contributions, and all participants are encouraged to actively participate in this webinar by asking questions and making comments. To do so, please either write in the chat room, raise your hand, or turn on your microphone to say hi, and I'll be delighted to include your perspective in the conversation. Tonight, our featured guest is Sean Hickey, a composer and managing director of Pentatone, a classical music recording label. Sean, welcome. Thanks, Simeon. Good to be here. Good to see you. So, Sean, tell us a little bit about uh, how you got into music recording and uh, how you got into the field. Uh, well, it was a little bit of luck, I think, about 30 years ago. I, um, I'm a composer, as you know, as you just mentioned, and I walked out of university with a degree in uh, composition and a minor in jazz guitar, and uh, I was more or less like, now what? And they don't really train you too much uh, for when you come out of music school as to uh, how to earn a living and uh, uh, find a, a, a path forward. And I was very lucky to have uh, graduated in the very early 1990s when the uh, record industry and the nascent uh, um, climb of the compact disc uh, came about. And I started as a sales rep, as a young sales rep with a distribution company, independent one in uh, my native Detroit. And I've since uh, many years later, or not many years later, a handful of years later, moved to New York City, where I uh, where I live, and uh, had a number of jobs, uh, including uh, almost 20 years as uh, ultimately senior vice president at Noxos, Noxos of America, and now uh, managing director of Pentatone Music, based here in the Netherlands. And Sean, can you tell us a little bit, on a personal note, the role that recorded music has played? Uh, during your life, uh, throughout your life. You talked uh, on a previous show about live music and how important it was when your parents drove you to the Symphony Center of Chicago and you got to hear the Symphony of Psalms by Stravinsky conducted by the uh, Georg Scholte and the Chicago Symphony. So that was a live mm. music experience. Tell us about recorded music experience. Yeah, well, I think my love of recordings uh, goes back even farther than that. Uh, I mean, I was raised on radio like so many people uh, were, and maybe some are, but certainly less, I would think. Um, you know, and I discovered uh, great music through listening to recordings and then going to record stores and spending a lot of time in my youth, especially uh, listening to people's opinions and listening to music in stores and buying LPs and later CDs, cassettes between the two, I think. And, um, you know, recordings for me have just been these sort of transformative things. I mean, it's just, uh, it's something that I've, you know, acquired thousands of over the years. And I certainly consider myself a collector. Um, and, you know, in some ways, uh, you know, it's just the, the you know, great embodiment of, uh, you know, a performer or a composer's idea to have, you know, if not a definitive recording, then a, you know, very appropriate one um, that, you know, you can take with you uh, however you like, and which is even easier now from, you know, in terms of portability, if not sound uh, reproduction, because we're all carrying these around and you can access the world's music uh, through them. And uh, it's been a big, uh, big development, obviously, in, uh, in the arc of uh, recorded music. But for me, I mean, recordings have, have been central to my life for, uh, 
yeah, for most of it. Fantastic. I think, uh, and most of us, I think, uh, share exactly what you're talking about, that same experience. Last week, we had Judy Sherman, uh, a Grammy nominated, or or, excuse me, a Grammy uh, recipient for Mm -hmm. for, uh, classical recordings, uh, a producer of classical recordings. And she really was uh, unhappy with the current situation of of listening to music and how she, she just said, I asked her, you know, please use these earbuds or whatever they're called to put in your ears because it's going to make the uh, conversation a little bit uh, more uh, audible to other people uh-huh. that way. You know, you're just going to be hearing me. And she said, I can't stand it. You know, you're trying, people try to put all of music into this thing, which is less than an inch long, you know, and I think what she means to say is that many of us uh, also, we had a different experience growing up listening to music uh, through these larger speakers. This idea of sound quality was very important. And that I think leads us uh, to our next philosophical conversation all the way back to Berlioz and this idea of double basses that were you know, three stories high in order to get the actual resonance, acoustic resonance that you wanna get from the bass instruments, which you know couldn't be in an eye, little eye pad or whatever it had to be in a much larger form physical form so tell us uh, now going back to that where you would be in a recording uh record recorded music shop talking with other people that also seems to have a different kind of music experience than going to symphony center to hear music live but it's it's also something that's disappeared going to the record stores before was uh, i mean we even had pop movies about that about how cool of a place it was how everyone wanted to work at one today that's also changed tell us a little bit now about how those that whole music was digitized and it lost its kind of tangible form with the perhaps a big exception of classical music, which still depends on printed music just as much as it does on recorded music. Uh, we we depend a lot on physical sales, surely, but it's uh, by no means even close to half of our income now. Um, any any label that uh, you know focuses too much on physical, I think, would do so at its peril. Uh, so we spend a lot more time, you know, trying to find ways to uh, elevate our material on the platforms asking our artists to elevate their material on the, on the platforms. And it's just uh, platform engagement is something that has to be done. Uh, all of that is said, uh, is to say that over the last five, seven, eight years, there's been an enormous uh, bit of nostalgia and resurgence back to record stores. In fact, more record stores opened in 2022 in the United States than probably any year in history. And, um, huge amount of used products, of course, as people have shedded and, uh, you know, uh, their collections over the years with format changes and did so again in the digital revolution that that uh, that includes streaming, of course. Um, there's a lot of collections out there. There's a lot of fascinating music and there are a ton of record stores. And I actually spend a fair amount of time in a couple of them. Uh, and there's a lot of people there hanging out on weekends talking to people about music and the, in the same way that I discovered uh, the Talking Heads and King Crimson and the Chicago Symphony and uh, John Coltrane, a lot of others. I mean, I first really encountered in in stores in Ann Arbor, Michigan and, and other places that, um, you know, it was a long time ago, but people are doing it again. And it's interesting that the sort of nostalgia thing that you find in those stores is, and the people that are buying vinyl now, you know, vinyl now, uh, vastly outsells the compact disc in the United States and, and many other markets in the world, except Japan, um, that most of the people that are buying them are nostalgic for a time that they never themselves lived through. Uh, the people that are buying vinyl now are in are 20 somethings. So they were born at the turn of the millennium around that time uh, when record stores that were there were beginning to close in their, their, in their youth uh, and the streaming transformation happened when they were 10 or 15 years old. So um, I think it's a very interesting thing. I mean, now the, the the broader industry that we have to deal with is that who do we serve? How do we serve as many people as possible? And it's, you know, it's a tremendous challenge. Right? We can't be all things to all people. The industry can't. Uh, but we can try to be as many things to as many people as we can and fail sometimes in the process. It's what has to happen sometimes. Fantastic. So let's go on right away to this is a video. Uh, we'll speak about your career at Pentatone in a moment, but this was originally a publicity video for Pentatone made just a few years ago. 
let's take a look at and see what pentatone wants to be. Uh, and as you say, everything, try to be everything to everybody. Skateboarding means the world for me. I can't live without skateboarding. Ik kan een stuk van je leven worden. Dat is bij mij geworden. Muziek is voor mij een grote quelle voor ontspanning. I'm a violinist because I love the sound of it, which is very similar to the human voice. Tennis is begonnen als een hobby. Ik ben begonnen toen ik een jaar of tien, elf was. Each time I learn a new trick or just even falling down the ground makes me feel wonderful. Ja, ik heb ook hier een achterhoek, een leuk optrekje waar ik me naar hartelust kan roeren. Muziek is, wie ik immer zeg, de batterij van mijn leven. En dan merk ik langzaam wie die energie terugkomt. Altijd als ik de baan op ga, dan vlak daarvoor zet ik mijn koptelefoon op, zodat je zelf in echt de goede moed komt om de baan op te gaan. En ja, muziek is daar heel belangrijk. I could never live without music. I think I would just really be like a plant without sunshine. Dat was ook in 42 was oorlog. Dan word je hem heel in de vet hoor, een stukje van de zeven van bezig op je. Oh, oh, en als je dat dan kon ontvangen, hè? oh, dat was geweldig. If I do like manual tricks, then I just listen to classical music because it keeps me focused and balanced. It's so important to have these moments in life where the time just stands still and where you are brought into another world. I think this is why music is so important. And I think it's actually for every person very important to have music in life. Okay, so that brings us to our next, uh, our first round table. What was Pentatone then and what is it now? On its website, Pentatone describes the company as follows, quote, Pentatone presents a diverse range of world-class artists and is dedicated to premium quality productions captured in exceptional sound. The label works together with today's and tomorrow's leading artists to provide timeless recordings of core, fringe, and lesser known repertoire with Pentatone's uncompromising attention to the best quality, best possible quality in artistry, design, and recording technology. The label was founded in the Netherlands in 2001 by three former Philips Classics executives with the ambition to offer classical music in the highest quality, including surround sound. From 2013, with a new management team, the label focused on embracing the digital era and expanding its repertoire. In recent years, Pentatone has won multiple awards. In 2017, John Corigliano's The Ghosts of Versailles won Best Opera Recording and Best Engineered Album at the 59th Grammy Awards. Two years later, the premiere recording of the Mason Bates opera, The Revolution of Steve Jobs, won a Grammy for Best Opera Recording. Pentatone was awarded Label of the Year in 2019 by Gramophone Magazine and in 2020 by the International Classical Music Awards. Pentatone's third decade promises to be even more exciting and innovative as we expand our growing and diverse roster of artists producing the most thrilling recordings in the world. End quote. So, Sean, you've been managing director of Pentaton since mid, uh, just uh, about a year now. It will be one year mm -hmm. in in uh, in March and April. So, tell us tell us about this company then and now. As the we saw in the video, it's trying to be uh, a lot of things to a lot of different people. Classical music, um, as most people imagine it, Beethoven. That's really at the center of uh, it's kind of promoting at least. It was then, of course, that was long before your time, promoting this pretty much what is cliche today in classical music. You can study to it, <laughs> helps you keep balance on your, your skateboard, you know, relaxes the lawyer. I mean, so tell us, mm -hmm. tell us about this company, please. Sure, sure. Well, one of the first things that we did when I got here last year was uh, to really kind of define some organizing principles for Pentatone um, because it had had different management over the years. 
um, and a very, very strong focus on quality of recordings and not always on uh, you know, the most exceptional artist, at least in its first few years. Uh, it was important for us to really uh, adequately and accurately define what it is we do. And the first couple of sentences that you read there are really, um, really the organizing principles that I and my team put together at this time last year. And can um, you repeat those so, again, Sean? Do you want me to repeat them? <laughs> yeah, you could probably read the very beginning of uh, yeah. Pentaton presents a diverse range of world-class artists and is dedicated to premium quality productions captured in exceptional sound. There you go. There you go. So we work with, uh, you know, obviously the great focus on sound is that, you know, Pentatone was one of the pioneers in SACD format at its start. That's all of what it did in its first 10 years. Uh, pioneers in surround sound, which we still do uh, a lot of, though not exclusively. We make a lot of stereo recordings too. Our adjacent company right behind this wall here is the uh, most preeminent surround sound uh, recording and mixing and editing environment in Europe, if not the world. Um, and, um, you know, but we deal with and work with world class artists, some of them incredibly well-known, famous names that you would know, like Magdalena Kojina and Pierre-Laurent Aymar and Lara Downs, and on and on, Ian Bostridge, Piero Bashkala. Um, but we also deal uh, and work a, a lot more closely with a lot of up-and-coming names, names that may not be household names, even in the world of classical music, uh, that are doing some really, really good things that have something to say uh, about repertoire. Um, and it's very meaningful for me with a couple of other areas uh, in our a and approach is one to really hear from some more diverse voices throughout the world uh, that we're going to be hearing a lot more from, you're going to be hearing a lot more from in the coming months. Uh, and then broadening our repertoire uh, geographically um, and then spanning time too with a lot more contemporary voices and composition, uh, but not exclusively so, but covering areas of repertoire that we haven't really covered as well and Pentaton has a good history of working with uh, or recording, say, the works of Bach, uh, but not necessarily contextualizing Bach and his time and what makes him a particular genius um, without the uh, without some of the sampling of what was going around during the time of Bach in, in the in, in his epoch. So uh, we're doing a lot more of that. We're going to have a lot more things that really kind of broaden repertoire wise um, you know what it is that that we wish to do and it's uh you know it's quite exciting we've got some new signings that that i'm very excited about so sean you mentioned this contextualizing and it what comes to my mind right away is uh what we spoke about at your former company naxos this kind of online system of education that gives you all of these different um, tools in order to, for somebody to get that context. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Is it something that goes beyond just uh, the um, the artist and um, performing? We saw at the beginning of this show, the conductor uh, there at with the Czech Philharmonic in this place, in this place at the center of Czech music and all that mm -hmm. and bringing this Czech composer to life. I mean, is, or excuse me, uh, well, Austro-Hungarian composer to life. So is, is that what you're talking about? Or can you, can you tell us a little bit more about that contextualization? Well, I mean, I happen to be one of those people that uh, if you were there in the uh, Rudolf Inum in Prague uh, and hearing Mahler II with the Czech Philharmonic led by Semyon Bichkov, you wouldn't necessarily need to know uh, turn of century Vienna and New York and, uh, you know, the, the, the Austrian mountains where he composed uh, that particular work, um, you know, uh, but it certainly helps. It could certainly help in the appreciation of a very big and sprawling and complex work to know a little bit about the circumstances in which it was composed, contextualization. Uh, it would also be helpful to know some of the composers and some of the musicians and some of the artists that were around Mahler at that time, it might give you a greater appreciation uh, of that particular work. But I'm not one. Uh, I'm not one of those people that says that you cannot enjoy uh, classical music without all of that knowledge. I think you can. Uh, most um, instrumental music, uh, for what you and I and many of us might agree, would be classical music, uh, requires one thing of us, and that's time. And Time is time. Time is a hard thing to come by. It's in short supply and in short order for all of us. Um, um, but it does ask that, and if you're willing to give it, it gives you a lot. 
if you uh, if you are not willing to give it, you are going to get less out of it. It's as simple as that. Uh, the contextualization, uh, I think, can really augment and enhance the whole experience, and I enjoy it very much, knowing the circumstances under which Mahler would have written his Resurrection Symphony, because um, they're fascinating, and the world was a fascinating place, and it's a fascinating one now. So um, I think it helps, but it, I don't think it's a prerequisite for for loving this art form. And Sean, about that, going back to this uh, Czech Philharmonic Orchestra there, I believe you're in Prague, and this gorgeous, gorgeous uh, concert hall. So let's link that then to our, our discussion of you in Ann Arbor at the record store, you know, with these other people or the younger people uh, now buying vinyl records. It seems to me that is an excellent and extremely uh, an exclusive way to be part of that, to get that that community is what you're willing to give your time and you feel part of that community when you leave and when you listen to the music you're part of that community right even if you're not physically or uh, temporarily in the same place at that moment so can you tell us about your vision to bring people that when we as we said it's now being in french they've got the fantastic uh, verb for uh, digitalization it's called dematerialization and mm -hmm. so now with that dematerialization it seems like it's going to be a little bit, there's going to be less context available. We don't have anything to hold in our hand. We've got to, we look up something and then we click a hyperlink and then that takes us somewhere else. And then we have to, uh, yeah. I mean, I can imagine again, as you said, and that's exactly what you said is, well, if you're there in that concert hall with these people, you get it. But tell us with this record company, it seems like you've got enormous challenges to bring that context to people. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. I think we do have enormous challenges. It's a big job. It's, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, one that I, you know, think about all the time. Um, you know, we have these conflicting things that um, I feel it myself, even with the uh, digitalization of every aspect of life and the sort of commodification of nearly everything in one's life. Uh, when you drink a proper coffee out of a proper ceramic cup, as opposed to a paper one with a plastic lid, cancer causing potential lid or whatever molten hot beverage, um, you know, it feels better. And there's a, <laughs> there's a simple return to that. Um, and we find that in the areas of music and the physical space, you know, as, as people are returning to vinyl and, you know, a lot of people are predicting another resurgence in the compact disc. I'll believe it when I, when I see it, uh, if it really starts picking up again, though it is, it is possible, um, you know, how how meaningful are all of those activities? I do get the fact that we can sit here on our devices all day long and doom scroll Twitter or, you know, fret about the news or watch, go down the rabbit hole of any type of video or any artist or anything or any bit of education that we have thanks to YouTube with uh, whatever, whatever it is, I don't know, a thousand hours of content uploaded every second. Um, we'll never get to the to the end of all of it, of course, you, you know, in a million lifetimes, you couldn't. So, you know, it, it comes down to how do we as individuals choose how we're going to spend our time. And a small subset of that is interested in classical music, and they may not live in central Prague. Uh, they may, and they may not go to concerts every night um, and experience that. And the recording is one way to capture a bit of magic. Uh, that uh, and you can have on your shelf or have in your collection or stream at your heart's desire uh, anytime you like, any point in your life and anywhere in the world. And, you know, that to me is a, you know, still, I mean, just the, just the magic of that, me being in a record store at age 13 or whatever, and having those experiences, I mean, it's still that that magic now is, I don't think it's ever left. And in many ways, it's it, it's returned maybe full force. There's There's a lot more, in in the act in the process of it that makes me you know very very excited about recordings and i would just say lastly i'm here in my office with a you know pretty impressive sound system with a cd player behind me there and in many ways it's just about the most optimal way for me personally to listen to music because it sounds great and i love it and i can work so yeah Fantastic. So let's now go into the artists at, and you're getting applause from our participants. So uh, let's uh, go into the artist of Pentaton. Uh, first, this is Tim Mead, and we will watch a video about his most recent Pentaton recording. 
This is an album born out of a series of lockdown videos I made with David Bates and Nuova Musica. At a time when there was no performance, we were drawn to the music of Henry Purcell as a way of getting back to what we knew. For me, there's something deeply familiar about this music, something that seems instinctive, something that seems almost natural. I wanted to bring in some gems from some of Purcell's contemporaries too, so we have some John Blow, some Pelham Humphrey and some William Webb to make it more of a collaboration of musical minds and explore how they might have inspired each other. In the emotionally heightened times of the last few years, this music seemed to have everything. There's beauty, joy, love, loss, anger, hope, and even faith, all expressed with a sublime intimacy. And it's no less cathartic now experiencing this music as we emerge from that darkness. I don't think that it's ever been more important for the music we sing to really mean something. And it's the marriage of word and note in this music that really makes these pieces feel like a spontaneous piece of creation. It's music that helps us feel, helps us think, brings us comfort and wraps us in its beauteous softness. Fantastic. Um, so, Sean, now tell us a little bit about Tim Mead. And I just wanted to point out again that Tim, he's in, he uses that video to point out to us the healing qualities of music and the things. I mean, we, you don't get that in pop music. You get, uh, I mean, kind of somebody, I don't know, screaming about, you know, uh, how, how angry they are, or you get some kind of dramatic, dramatic message or something. But this, this idea of, of you're using the music for another purpose, it just, it seems, it seems very classical music oriented to me. And I, I, I don't know why. Yeah, that may be so, though, I think, you know, certainly not limited to classical music. And it, it is part of the uh pop music vocabulary, lexicon, or whatever you want to call it, in, in, in a variety of um, genres, I think. Um, Tim Mead, uh, you're actually previewing a record that's not out for another month. So Tim Mead is uh, is a countertenor, as you heard there, English. Um, and uh, I actually just listened to the album in its entirety for the first time this morning, and it, it's wonderful. It's really, uh, really nice to have him uh, as part of the Pentatone family. He's, um, you know, quite an extraordinary singer. And yeah, the the album, that particular uh, album, Beauty of Softness, really um, focuses on the, the the life and songs of Henry Purcell. And then that music is also contextualized by some of the composers around him at that time. And Purcell died very young. I want to say 26, if I'm not mistaken, 27. And he produced a lot of music in a rather short time. So he lived 10 years less than Mozart did um and known for his songs and um you know it's a very interesting it, it ended up being like a really conceptual um album that is you know we're always drawn to people with programs and not just programs for a concert program where you have an orchestra might have an overture and then it might have a concerto and then a break and then a symphony of three or four movements um that is of less interest to us but you know a concept a real you know a story you know what you know people buy albums and people you know really dig into deeply into music at least at the album level because there's you know someone telling a story because we respond to, to storytelling as as listeners and um and and Tim's album is an example of that for sure um Sean and so when you when you say that it makes me again think about the conversation I had uh, last week with uh, Drew the Sherman and she was saying that one of the best parts of her job is called the sequencing of the recording. In other words, where she is during the mastering, mastering process, deciding what goes where and to create that kind of overall story through the music. And I told her, well, you know, of, of course, that when you tell me about a concept album, I think about uh, the, the Beatles. And I think it's a, a, a Sergeant Pepper. I think about this, this whole album that was created to go together 
all mm -hmm. all in one piece and that seems that that's how how we view things today that it's uh, and, and she said yes of course if you've got a you know beethoven string quartets you put those two together because they're the only two that fit together the length of a of a recording but yeah we were constantly trying to put that together so tell us a, a, about that then the marketing part that you were saying that you're reaching for other markets i imagine asia is a really important market you're you're going for they seem to based on uh what what i read that they have the largest classical music market opportunities that in Europe, in the West, that there are kind of a lot of musicians, but that they're working a lot there in the, in the Asian countries. They just have very, very enthusiastic um, uh, audiences, even in, in chi some mid-sized Chinese cities, 12 opera houses or something, any any individual, any given night. So tell us about that, that and how you're going to, and and where this album then goes, this beauteous softness. What, what are the next steps and and how do you bring that then and how is that going to be then consumed by uh by consumers well i mean it's hard to make uh really strong generalizations of the largest continent in the world uh that supplies half half the world's population uh but i can say some uh specific things about some specific markets so you know for instance japan which is the largest physical sales market more more physical products are sold in japan than anywhere over the last two years including the united states uh and that still has a very vibrant record store scene in fact there's 62 or so uh tower record stores in japan and nowhere else in the world um uh so physical sales if we're doing our job right um will resonate in japan in China, they're 100% impossible. It is not a market that we can remotely do business in, thanks largely for many, many, many years of pirating. Um, and it's not advised that we do so. Fortunately, at this point, China is not a targeted market for physical sales. And the same is true of India, too, because um, you know the explosive growth of the middle class in those two countries uh, have allowed um well uh, exploding middle class and the bandwidth to support um you know to support lo music listening have meant that the sort of uh physical sales and download steps have largely been skipped so the huge amount of people are online they're listening they're streaming uh and that's where our focus is based and a lot of our the, the huge largest part of our marketing efforts in the uh, on our dsp platforms whether they be amazon apple music spotify Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, uh, are really centered around track-based marketing as opposed to album-based marketing, and the uh, the point of which is that a, a well-placed track in a well-listened-to playlist uh, could get a lot more attention for Tim Mead than all of the CD sales in the world combined. Um, there just aren't that many of uh, of them in the classical music genre right now, but far more people are discovering classical music on Spotify than at any point in human history. There are more people listening to classical music than at any point in history, even if they never go to a concert, even if they don't know how to tune a violin or have no music education whatsoever. There uh, are a lot more people really engaging with this music, maybe not deeply, maybe on the side, maybe they're putting it on while they're studying, or reading or cooking an omelet or going to sleep, but they are, and it's something, and we do all we can to try to, um, you know, attract those people to our, uh, to our catalog. So Sean, if I understand correctly, then in China, you're not going to sell any physical products because they get pirated, but the playlists, this kind of digital infrastructure is exactly where a Chinese consumer would go. They would not want to go to some strange third rate website to hear a pirated mp3 version or a pirated version of the song they want to go to spotify they want to go to the trusted uh digital infrastructure in order to consume music is that right they would use the platforms that are available to them in china yes and there are a few and our music is available there uh for stream and uh you know, uh, 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 as far as I know, a Chinese citizen or someone in based in the PRK, uh, PRC rather, would access their music either with an ad supported version or um, or a paid version similar to you or I uh, with Spotify. 
So yeah, it is available on those platforms. Wow. Okay. And we have here a, a comment from Sherry Grant. Greetings from New Zealand. I love the idea of storytelling. I'm developing a story for my Asian tour piano recitals about New Zealand, showcasing many New Zealand composers works this June, tied in with the International Catherine Mansfield 100th Festival. I am organizing for the end of this year. It is very important to develop a unique way of storytelling, and I am presenting music with poetry interwoven into the story. Sean, does that um, resonate at all, this idea of, of storytelling, of multi, uh, using even uh, different forms of media in order to do storytelling? Sure, absolutely. I mean, we've toyed, you know, been toying for a, a number of years with the concept of what an album is or what it should be. Does it need to be this fixed thing? Um, I don't think, you know, an album necessarily needs to have some fixity to it. Uh, you wouldn't want to reorder Sgt. Pepper, for instance, the track order. I mean, it would really, or, or Pink Floyd, The Wall, or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, there's no nothing that says in the digital space that it uh, needs to be this 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 fixed thing. It could be mobile, and at that point, it really kind of turns leans into the area of of playlist. Or you know, at some point, the the difference between uh, album and playlist is completely blurred because traditionally, album is a fixed thing, a playlist is a living thing, and it's changing. Um, but uh, there's been a lot of people now over 30 years that have done a lot of book and music hybrids. Poetry and music hybrids, uh, obviously visual albums are used thousands of times a day by a variety of artists on all of the platforms. Um, and then you have segments, you know, you have visual visualizations of tracks and albums, uh, Spotify Canvas, which is now, I think, three or four years old. Apple Music has similar things. Amazon has similar things. Everybody is doing something to try to attract attention, ears and eyeballs, Um and um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, it's definitely something in a, you know, wide open world in terms of, uh, you know, what one can do and anything is possible. It's just how, how easy it is to really attract a wide audience and make a commercial as well as an artistic case that, that, that in many ways is the hard part. You know, I don't try not to make value judgments on music. I don't love everything, but I certainly love what I love a lot. Uh, and I try not to make value judgments in our work at Pentatone because, um, you know, these are uh, incredibly dedicated, uh, valued and hardworking artists that are giving them their time and a whole lot more than their time, their their talent and their and their love for the, these the, these works. Um, and we need to treat them well and we want to treat them well. Um, sometimes the commercial case is harder to make with everything. And we have to take those considerations always because there are costs. So. Wow. I bet they really, really appreciate that support. So yeah. this brings us now to our uh, second round table. What is this? And uh, so please bear with me. This is a long text I'm going to read. What is the San Francisco Conservatory of Music? And why has it undertaken the extraordinary acquisitions of Pentatone and the classical music management companies, Opus 3 Artist and Askinus Holt? Sean, we are taught in pre-pandemic business school that companies should focus on what management scientists Prahlad and Hamill call their quote unquote core competencies. A consensus definition of core competencies might be that a conservatory, say the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, would be teaching students music and developing the pedagogical and research expertise of its faculty. All non-core competencies, say managing the careers of established musicians or marketing those musicians' music products would fall outside the scope of what the conservatory does most efficiently. It should be noted that since the term core competencies was first introduced by those management scientists in 1990, a time that everyone, even the Soviets, were fascinated by the promise of market liberalization, free transnational capital flows, and globe-spanning supply chains. Post-pandemic, the promise of free trade looks much more dismal. Inflation has taken the world by storm, and out-of-control prices have made us all think twice about outsourcing our needs. Just take the recent run on egg-laying chickens for domestic use as an example. With that said, the San Francisco Conservatory of Music's current business vision may or may not be uncommon today. However, its recent mergers and acquisitions have raised plenty of eyebrows. Let's take a look at the finances of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music and see what story they tell us. The San Francisco Conservatory of Music is a 501c3 corporation that, at the end of 2016, listed gross receipts at $95 million and assets totaling $138 million, 
$25 million of which were liabilities. The picture five years later has drastically changed. At the end of 2021, San Francisco Conservatory of Music listed gross receipts at $74 million and total assets at $342 million, of which $110 million were liabilities. Furthermore, we are told a completely different story by the Conservatory's 2021-2022 overview. In it, it clearly puts students and faculty at the center of its business, highlighting that it has 228 undergraduate students, 282 pre-college students, 174 graduate students, and 170 continuing education students. According to that report, the Conservatory's core competencies only cost $52 million a year, and that is covered by $53 million in annual revenue. That overview is completely different from the income statements we just went over. None of the aforementioned increases in liabilities are mentioned. Neither is the news about the acquisition of Pentatone by the Conservatory in May 2020 and the classical management firm Askinus Holt in December 2022. The document does mention an alliance, quote unquote, with the management firm Opus 3 Artists, which the Conservatory acquired in 2020, but seems to take pains to show that it is focusing on its core competencies, namely its student and faculty. Sean, what are the core competencies of today's San Francisco Conservatory of Music? What role does Pentatone play in promoting those competencies? And is this what the Music Conservatory of Tomorrow looks like? Those are three questions. I can answer two and three fairly well, I think. Um, the first one, as to the core competencies of the conservatory, I, 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 I wouldn't speak on the behalf of, of, of the conservatory and the work that they do. I'm sure they would uh, they would gladly uh, state that their core competencies, you know, uh, put the student first and, and, and their education first. Uh, but the reason, um, you know, the reason the conservatory got in to forming an alliance that can, uh, includes two management companies and a notable record label is that um, they look at the vision of what a conservatory is, at least in America, and what it can be. And um, it was truly the thing that attracted me to this job in the first place when we first started speaking about it. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, I've been in this industry for 30 years. And one of the questions I've had a very, very hard time answering for myself, and I've done a lot of things in this business uh, is how does a label make money? And I only now am starting to understand after managing one um, for a year um, how that how that is to work. And the, the truth of the matter is that at least as a for-profit venture, a record label, at least in the classical music space as a for-profit venture, um, does not. And most of them, if they survive and continue to survive, have some degree of state or local support, some degree of philanthropy, or they have another business. Maybe they run a recording studio. Maybe they handle uh, mastering. Maybe the owner and manager is also a tone meister, producer, uh, whose work is hired out. Um, maybe they uh, have a sidearm in, in publishing. I think of a lot of German labels that... Uh, you know, pu publish uh, liturgical music, printed music for uh, uh, for churches. Um, uh, there's a lot of other things. Pentatone has never been one of those labels. Pentatone has been a label independent uh, and 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 free thinking and trying to um, you know deliver the artistic quality as outset uh, as outlined in our organizing principles and whatever principles were there before. Uh, but the conservatory, you know, being part of this larger picture of what it means to be um what it means to be a musician today um the alliance provides something that can and should be attractive to the current and future student who may attend the conservatory and that is they don't have to go through necessarily the student there the process that i went through when i graduated from college 30 years ago which is what now what do I do? And the conservatory um, has the ability to at least say like, well, listen, we have, you know, these competencies, whether they're core or fringe. Uh, I, I like to think that they're somewhere between the two and they will grow as our relationships grow and as our uh, partnership deepens. In our case, it's quite deep. 
um, that uh, a student that comes out of the school knows that this conservatory where they've spent four or more years learning the violin or whatever, knows a bit about music management, knows a bit about the economics of, uh, of, of, of managing a record label, knows a bit about various things because the world of music is very big, very broad. Um, and, you know, the, the, the possibility not to dash anyone's hopes, uh, of, of getting a spot in the Berlin Philharmonic, uh, violin section is pretty remote because the orchestra is only so big and there's, you know, heaven knows how many violent, competent violinists are in the world with educations. So, um, there's a lot of things in this alliance and in this partnership that, um, attract me tremendously. We're exploring a lot of those right now. Uh, we have access to um, the most, arguably the most oppressive uh, structure uh, and building in North America built by any institution of higher learning in the space of music. And that's the Bose Center in central San Francisco, uh, which has four concert halls, state-of-the-art recording facilities, dorm rooms, uh, housing for the local population, a restaurant, uh, Classical California KDSC radio station, and on and on. And uh, we, have, we as a record label have access to those facilities to make recordings with some of our artists, which we're very excited about too. Wow. Okay, let's take a look. I think I've got it right here. So uh, the Bose Center, and we're looking at it right in the center here? That no, was... that's the uh, that's the view from the Bose Center. Oh, so that's it. the opera. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it nice. is right right there in the center. Yeah, that's those are some of the interior photos that you see there. Yep, there's some of the halls. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, that the black that's the black box that I was in last week and did a uh, did a radio interview there. Some of the dorms. Oh, wow. The front entrance, yep. So, um, so wow, that is really, really exciting. And it's, did you get a chance to talk with any of the students there at the conservatory? Did you get a chance to kind of uh, what's uh, get, a, get a, a feeling for the vibe there? Are, every, are all the people so excited? As I, I mentioned in the overview 2021, 2022, it seemed to be Kind of like business of usual, no mention of this new uh, this new bow center or anything. What's uh, what's going on there? What am I uh, not privy to? Well, I think um, you know. Obviously, you know you can tell from the numbers there. At least I can deduce from the numbers that that was the uh, the year that the center opened. Opened in the midst of the pandemic, if I'm not mistaken, in very early 21 or very end of 2020. Um, and the money uh, that the conservatory has raised, I mean, because they're a fundraising organization as a 501c3, uh, took them a number of years to realize and then, and, then, and then a number of years to have this building built. Uh, so you have all of that there. I have talked to some students. I haven't talked to a ton, but I've uh, certainly loads of faculty and all the administration. I was just there a week ago. Uh, and the students are very excited about this. They don't wholly know what it all means. But then again, when I was 18 or 20, I didn't know much about what anything meant in the world of business. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't take that as uh, something all that worthy of comment, really, other than to say, you know, I think a lot of people don't necessarily know what it means, but I think they will. Um, and I think over time, as, uh, you know, we have, uh, well, I should say, you know, we also have the ability to, um, you know, bring a lot of our artists there and the same is true with asking assault and opus three that we can um you know educate students in the form of master classes what it is that we do and uh that's a very exciting thing you know any student wants to, should be able to have access to professionals doing the work that they're doing not necessarily not just the you know great violinists and pianists of the world or what have you uh but maybe leaders in business in the broader business of music and that's uh that's something that I wish I would have had when I was uh, when I was in school too. Fantastic! How exciting and inspiring. So, Sean, uh, then tell us a little bit before we uh, wrap up here. Tell us about um, actually. Let's go first to our video. We've got another video from a Pentatone, a Pentatone artist. Let's take a look here at that.
Over the last years, I was able to record over 20 albums. I was very lucky to record so many different repertoire. But it was always my wish to record this combination between Bach and Perth. Both composers have one special thing in common. Either if I play Bach or Perth, it always feels like it's coming from a different world. It's very spiritual. It feels like both have the same idea, but bringing it out on a complete different way. When I play Bach and Perth, then I forget everything around me. I'm just in this very spiritual moment uh, feeling and yeah, like the time is standing still. Fantastic. Uh, so, Sean, tell us now, we've gotten a, an incredible look at what seems to be the future, uh, the vision of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music uh, in Pentatone and this uh, new vision of what a conservatory could be, um, which is very, very exciting. Tell us uh, what excites you about uh, your, your today and your in Barn, Netherlands. Last week, you're in, you were in San Francisco. Next week, what excites you uh, when you think about next week, uh, about the future of classical music? Next week, I return to Interlock in Michigan, where our daughter goes to school, and there's still uh, maybe two feet of snow on the ground. So I will say not, not too much excites me, uh, at least next week. But uh, after that, you know, quite a lot of things. I mean, we'll return home to New York. Um, and, you know, uh, though I, it's exhausting, I do, uh, I do like the lifestyle of uh, being in these different places and being part of these this broader musical community um i'm really excited about what this uh alliance means for us uh and the and the conservatory i mean the autonomy and the authority of the constituent organizations is sacrosanct uh to those of us that run them and to the school itself um and there and and that said there are some ways that we can really start sharing resources and thinking a little more creatively um, about a lot of things. And I'm excited about that. We're already doing, you know, quite a few things. And, you know, we've really, you know, over the last year, um, you know, gotten the staff that is here at Pentatone is incredibly dedicated, incredibly hardworking, and they're finding opportunities that we just didn't have. Uh, it, well, maybe we had them, but we didn't have them as much as we do now or the time to really dedicate toward toward finding them, including sync placements in um in film and television for our music, a lot of other placements in uh, airlines, KLM, Lufthansa, and uh, and Delta, and other airlines where you'll find uh, Pentatone recordings on some flights. Now, uh, there, there's a lot uh, there's a lot of income that we haven't explored, and frankly, I'm uh, you know maybe personally excited at, at Pentatone more for the fact that uh, you know what are we not thinking about now? What am I not thinking about now? Um, and what can we do? You know, we talked a little bit about the, the sort of variable or nature of the album. It doesn't necessarily need to be a fixed thing. I'm not saying that we're going to be pioneers in that area, but we might. I'm really excited about working with a broader and more diverse group of artists. Um, we're really excited to work with, uh, for instance, the National Brass Ensemble, which is kind of an all-star team of brass players from the United States. Uh, recorded in San Francisco with SFCM engineers and uh, an incredibly uh, well done. We're working with Pierre Laurent Aymar and the Bartok Piano Concertas, which coincidentally we recorded with the San Francisco Symphony. Um, we are working with the Czech Philharmonic, as you saw there, our Bella Steinbacher, as you saw in the video there, and a, a variety of artists throughout the world, new, noteworthy all of the noteworthy, um, some very well known, some lesser known, and there's there's just a lot of ways that we can really kind of develop our profile over time, and we really, really, truly want to grow our catalog. I mean, that's really the sort of, you know, that is a core competency of an independent classical music record label to have enough of a catalog to really make make a financial mark and really deliver value to its artists. We don't have the benefit of shareholders, so uh, say per se. So we're the, the value we deliver is to our artists and to one another, and of, which of course uh, impacts our bottom line. 
Wow. Okay. So Sean, how is it best for uh, us to have people stay in touch with you? We have your website here, seanhickey.com. Uh, and we also have, uh, and next to it, if I can get over there, we have the Pentatone, um, the Pentatone website, which is right here. To the right. Oh, excuse Looks me. Like there it is. There you Pentatone. Go. There it is. So is it is it best uh, for people to uh, reach out to you through Pentatone or your own, uh, your personal website? You can reach me through my website directly, and um, also uh, there under the About Us section of Pentatone, there's, uh, I think I'm there too as well. Um, fantastic. Yeah, I think there at the bottom. Is, with Sean Hickey, yeah. Managing Director. Fantastic. Okay, yeah. so everybody, pentatonemusic.com, that's uh, where, uh, that is the company, and also Sean has his own website, excuse me, it's not that one, it's this one, seanhickey.com. And we can stay in touch. You can stay in touch about uh, Sean's newest works that are coming out. As you can tell, he's uh, he's attacking classical music on all fronts. This is very, very, very exciting time to be part of classical music. Thank you so very much, Sean Hickey, for your insight and inspiration. Thanks. I mean, I appreciate it. I appreciate your time. And uh, Sherry Grant writes, thanks for this fantastic interview. So let's take a look at what is coming up Next week, we have Francesca Royster, Black Country Music. Music unites us, but it also divides us. We unconsciously foster strong associations between music, gender, and race. Just close your eyes and think about Beethoven's Choral Symphony. It celebrates music's unique power to unite disparate individuals into one universal human family. But how many women do you see? And how many of those women are black? Now think about the blues and right after Madonna's music. In the case of the former, do you see any white men? And of the latter, do you see any Asian men? Which gender and racial profiles seem to belong to each other and which seem out of place? Keep in mind, if you have trouble simply imagining those music outsiders, how daring it must be for an outsider to show up at a concert. Professor Francesca Royster's new book is a diary-like account of her journey to find belonging in a music world not known for including Black women, especially lesbian Black women, that of country and Western. Her discoveries are at once insightful, exciting, and painful. Who knew that Tina Turner used country and Western to perform male, female liberation and independence from male domination? Yet it is reconciliation and not retribution that Royster really wants. In line with the promise of Beethoven's Choral Symphony, she deeply wishes that music's magic would dissolve the barriers separating her from fellow fans. But for the time being, she finds her place with like-minded and like-gendered and like-raced musicians and resigns herself to attentively listening for the revolutions of the next generation. Come welcome Francesca to our show, and she will introduce us to country and Western music. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www.simianmore.com. Again, that's Francesca Royster, Black Country Music. And again, for our viewers in the United States, it will again be one hour later than usual. So once again, thank you so very much to Sean Hickey. Thank you very much to Agnieszka and Benoit Riole for their support of this show. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile. From Barn, the Netherlands, and New London, New Hampshire, goodbye, and see you next Wednesday. Thanks, everyone. You're welcome.